I was assigned with the duty to manage this panel, but while I was assigned with du this duty, this responsibility, in the Paris Museum of Sunan Crunch Foundation, the Parajanov exhibition, um, I was expected there as well, but unfortunately, because of the Chinese modern art exhibition, the Parajanov exhibition was supposed to be closed on the 17th of March. Can you not hear me? Okay. So, in order to show you some images, Sargis, Sarkis Zabinyan, the distinguished artist, paid honors to Parajanov, and on the fifth floor, Uh, from the exhibition uh, exhibition i wanted i asked from my colleagues to prepare a video of that exhibition so without boring you with too many details i wanted i want to show you that exhibition i want to give you an idea about that exhibition and then i would like to utter a few words about the mediterranean statute and then i will start the panel First of all, I would like to ask my friends from the technical desk to show how Sarkis established the exhibition, how he laid out the exhibition. I want him to show you a very short film. About Parajano exhibition, we are going to show you a three minute video. Audio jungle. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
66 yıllık ömrünün Yes, in 20 years of his, of his 66 years year old life he was in prison because of the oppressive regime. The Suram Castle legend Aşık Garip his unforgettable films, movies. He was born in Georgia but he has Armenian roots. So I would like to commemorate him with these short films. I would like to pay my respects to him. I also would like to speak about Sarkis Zabunyan who contributed a lot to this exhibition and the uh, distinguished designer Bülent Erkman and Paraganoç Museum uh, personnel and Para Museum personnel. I would like to congratulate all of them on this occasion. Now, let's talk about the Mediterranean statute. In order to understand this statute, we need to know about Ilham Koman. Of course, this, the time limits of this panel is not enough to describe him, but he is one of the two very important poets of the Turkish literature, Can Yücel and Oktay Rifat. I mean, these two very important poets dedicated two poems to this uh, person, so he is very important. The first poem is Can Yücel's poem. He says, he talks about Ilham Koman, and uh, there the speaker reads a poem dedicated to uh, to him. Neyinden kuzeyine kutupların battı batacak teknesiyle reciting reciting a poem of Can Yücel. Another important poet Oktay Rifat also dedicated a poem to uh, to him and now the speaker is reciting the poem dedicated yine süzülüyordu evcil kadırgasıyla her akşam bir gül yağmuruna tutuyordu tunç toplarıyla İsveç kıyılarını yürekli bir kaptandı o sevdiği uğruna ölse ne gam ama Rüzgarlı heykelleriyle ölümün toprağına çıktığında çamura ve mermere doymamıştı daha. Evcil kadırgasından bir akşam üstünde düşleri çığlık çığlığa. İlhan Koman böyle bir sanatçı. So this was the kind of artist Orhan Koman was. One of those statues is the Mediterranean statute, statute as you know. In 1980s, the Halk Insurance Building in uh, Büyükdere um, was decorated with this set, stat, statute, and then the statute was attacked. It was four ton uh, heavy, and different metal panels were brought together to make this statute a very interesting one. Orhan Koman made a speech in Sedat's Mavi award ceremony and here is what he said about this statute. This uh, statute talks about the embrace of people, the love of people, and I thought of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is large, it's larger than us, and I wanted to use it in order to talk about embracing and love. And Another saying of Koman, he says, if this statute was put in the entrance of a port in the Mediterranean, only if it was greeted by the horns of ship that go by. This is the kind of statute that the Mediterranean statute was. At the moment, we are in a building on the Istiklal, Istiklal Avenue. Um, and the statute is now here and greeting all the people that pass by. It was uh, displaced many times. It was attacked as well. This is very meaningful. Let's not attack people. Let's not attack statutes. Let's not kill them. Let's not damage them. And hereby I will conclude my remarks on this statute and I will start our panel. The uh, theme of our panel is art and memory, as I said before. Our first speaker 
is Agnieszka Sieradzka. Sieradzka is a, an art uh, histo historian. He graduated from Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Um, at the moment, he is the curator of the art collection in Auschwitz-Birkenau museums. He is especially interested in art that uh, was in the concentration camp. Uh, she was um, she was a, a cura she is interested in art in uh, concentration camps. She is um, especially interested in these areas in this um, function of art. Now, I would like to give the floor to her for her to deliver her speech uh, in this issue. But I also would like to say that I will introduce our other panelists, Andras Kinets and Charles Duggan, later to you. Now, I will give the floor to Agnieszka Sieradzka. It's difficult to say in 20 minutes about so diverse and meaningful collection um, of the camp art covered in the, the Auschwitz Museum. But I, I'll try to paint for you the general character of this collection, uh, its uniqueness and uh, significance uh, to today's education. I'll show you some examples of, uh, of the camp art and also uh, some exhibitions where I was curator and uh, where we can see how to use the camp art today uh, in today's education. Uh, precisely there, behind the barbed wire, uh, of the German Nazi concentration camp and extermination center, art took an extraordinary significance. In the camp situation, it became not only ability, but the essence of his humanity. Never, be, never before, art had it played such an important role in rescuing, res, rescuing what was profoundly human. Never, uh, the, the, the Nazi Germans did everything uh, in their power to deprive people uh, of their dignity and human feelings. Uh, abasement was one of the fundamental forms of terror, terror. In just these conditions, art became a mighty power that saved prisoners from total beastliness and awakened faith in the indestructibility of human values. The Auschwitz Museum possesses among its holdings a unique collection of works created behind the barbed wire of the German Nazi concentration camps. This collection holds about 2,000 artworks made by prisoners inside the camps, both works done on order for, for the SS staff and illegal, uh, crea uh, illegal works created by prisoners in the greatest secrecy, documenting crimes and expressing the feelings. Drawings that depict the terrifying reality of the camp, portraits of fellow prisoners, works expressing longing and hope of the imprisoned people. The gathering of such a uh, large collection was possible thanks to the efforts of former prisoners and very often artists who created such works in the camp. Former prisoners set about recovering their lost works al almost immediately after the end of the war, above all by contacting other prison former prisoners who might be in possession of these works. It can only be assumed, because no records are left from this period, that some of the works were found on the grounds of the former camps, camp and also in private houses uh, in city Oświęcim occupied by assessment during the war. It's surely impossible to recreate a full comprehensive image of camp art. Uh, 
At present, it's not possible to state precisely how many artworks were created in Auschwitz and other concentration camps. Accounts by prisoners and extant archival material support the assumption that there were many more than have been recovered. The majority of them were dispersed. Some works were carried uh, into the depths of the Far Reich by assessment, and some were lost during the evacuation of the camp and in the first month after the liberation. There is quite a large group of works made by prisoners officially on, or, and, uh, on orders of the SS. These works, because their natural purpose and conditions of the execution are completely different than art created secretly. The assessment in Auschwitz uh, German Nazi concentration camp didn't just exploit the inmates' physical strength, but also their intellectual powers and artistic talent. In Auschwitz, craftsmen's workshops were established already in 1940 to cater for the camp's immediate, immediate immediate uh, needs such as repairs, construction works, and making fittings, fittings but also for quasi-artistic projects such as decorative lamps, chandeliers, trimmings, and etc. The situation was similar with the camp's offices like building office and writer's office. The prisoners employed in them did ordinary office jobs, but those with a talent were commissioned for work uh, calling for specific skills, such as diagrams for instruction sheets, mock-ups, pictures for the camp's development plans, illustration to record the development of disease and document medical experiments. But the SS men also used prisoners' artistic talents for their own private purposes, making them uh, do pictures which they sent home. Usually on the pretext of propaganda operations, they would commission prisoners to paint pictures in line with their ideology and taste. These would be mostly portraits, landscapes, generic, generic sense, the, pris the prisoners who, didn't such, uh, who did such works could get extra food rations, less exhausting work, or simply avoided being beaten. Although prisoners uh, were officially required to execute works on specific commissions, and had to fit to the tastes of the assessment, the supplies and conditions put at their disposal also enabled them to create art for themselves, of course, secretly. Thanks to this, a considerable numbers of works on forbidden subjects could be created in Auschwitz. The majority of the works uh, created behind the camp the barbed wire were made illegally using materials stolen from the SS offices or camp workshops. They included valuable documentation of the reality of the camp, revealing the truth about the place and also identifying the guilty becoming evidence of one of the worst crimes in the history of the world. Creative impulses were varied, but were always deeply rooted in the reality of the camp. Some prisoners made artworks to tear themselves away from the nightmare that surrounded them in order to rescue their endangered mental stability. Others did so in order to commit what they had seen to canvas or paper. Others still painted or sculpted to earn additional crust of bread. Art helped maintain the mental agility and psychological equilibrium that were so essential to the fight for survival in radically extreme conditions. It was one means of expressing strong emotions and also the realization of the need for beauty 
dictated by ordinary human sensitivity. In many cases, art expresses the powerful human need to leave some trace of oneself behind. It was the hope of prisoners that even if they died, there would remain behind a drawing that testified to their suffering. Portraits constitute the largest group of artworks made in the camp. Although making a portrait uh, involved a high level of risk, since it was a means of identifying both the model and the artist, a prisoner's wish to have a portrait of themselves made was greater than their fear of potential consequence. Your portrait um, was material evidence that you were still alive. In many cases, it was also a message to a prisoner's nearest and dearest, as many prisoners attempted to have their pictures smuggled out to their family using various ways and means, all of which were dangerous. Today, some of these portraits serve as a final memento from those who were killed. A man in Auschwitz lost everything. Name, sure name, nickname, personal documents. He got a number, and he was a number. He had to remember this number. He had to react immediately to this number. For the man reduced for a number, for a prisoner, prisoner deprived of his identity, dignity, and personal attributes, an illicit portrait was the one of the way to rescue his own fragile memoir of himself. Peter Edel's double portrait is one of the most telling works of concentration camp art. It asks one of the hardest questions facing an individual reduced to a number, stripped of his human dignity downtrodden and stamped into the ground. Am I still myself? The artist presents himself before his arrest, a free man in civilian clothes, and as a prisoner in striped camp uniform with his head shaven and his prisoner number. His face has changed so much that it's hard to tell whether it's the same person especially as he can't recognize himself. Ill and exhausted by work and hunger, Peter Edel, the maker of this drawing, points a finger at himself. In the bottom left-hand corner, there is a question which, which the artist put to himself after he had passed through the gate, Arbeit macht frei. Who is this? You, me, yes. In other work, another prisoner of Auschwitz, Josef Scheine, used a piece uh, of wrapping paper and the simplest means of expression to present both a crowd of people reduced to a shaven head over a striped prison uniform as well as the individuality of each figure. If you view this picture from a distance, you see a virtually abstract composition of dots and stripes. But on taking a closer look, you notice that the head of each figure is a fingerprint, a mark that identifies each of us as an individual. This gives the composition a deeper meaning, no one, not even the criminal machinery of the Nazi concentration camps can erase the identity of the human individual. You can see on these examples, these two examples, how much we can read from the works of the camp art about the condition of a man, about his inner struggle for his humanity in a dehumanized world, 
how great it gives us opportunities and ways to educate young people, not only through pure, fa pure facts and numbers. The works of art showing the reality in the camp is the smallest group in the Auschwitz Memorials, Memorial Museum's collection. There was obvious reason for this. Making pictures of this type carried an enormous risk. There was a strict prohibition on disclosing what went on in the camp. In one of the first orders, Rudolf Hess, commander of Auschwitz, forbade the assessment to take photographs on the site of the camp. Those photos which were made, mostly for the needs of the construction department, don't show the whole truth about the concentration camp. The prisoners on them are good dressed and are being treated well. The drawings made by prisoners showing their inside stories from the inmates' points of view absolutely invaluable. Done hastily and in secret, their sketches are a record of the appealing facts and incidents that took place in the camp. Some of these drawings must certainly have been done in the hope that would, uh, would be preserved as tangible evidence of the atrocities committed in Auschwitz, even if their makers didn't manage to survive. The museum also collects works made after the war by former prisoners, documenting events that they witnessed in the camp. These works is complemented by uh, um, to, to the small group of drawings depicted reality of the camp created in Auschwitz. These works are narrative in nature and play important role in learning about the, the history of concentration camps because of their immediacy, immediacy and capacity for convoying emotions such works of art are used widely for educational purposes. Both camp and post-war uh, art have a huge uh, value as a unique iconographic source. They are the basis uh, for the, the creation of an exhibition, uh, exhibitions presenting the fate of prisoners at Auschwitz in various ways to show people from the inside the prisoners' feelings and emotions as an illustration of each stage in the prisoner's life, like exhibition The Experience of Auschwitz in the Art of Former Prisoners, which is traveling exhibition dedicated to the schools, of which shows the fate of the victims of the largest German concentration and extermination camp Auschwitz, presented in the works of those who survived it. Images of catastrophic living conditions, hunger, work beyond strength, humiliation and beating accompanied by quotes from written memoir and accounts of former prisoners, create image of terrifying life in the camp. Thanks to the painted relation, we can understand more about what Auschwitz was, we can imagine it, and we can realize it. The exhibition David Oler, the one who survived crematorium free, which will be presented at the former Auschwitz I uh, campsite until this month, to the, to the end of March, Shows us, shows, us to the work, uh, shows us the works of a former Zonderkommando prisoner. The exhibition depicts the subsequent uh, stages of the extermination process, from the moment of arrival at the ramp and selection to killing in gas chambers and burning of bodies in the crematorias, recorded just after the war in documentary drawings and then uh, in huge paintings. It's the largest exhibition of works by David Oler so far, presenting almost the entire exceptional work related to the artist's traumatic experiences in the camp as a Zonderkommando prisoner. 
the exhibition tries to show us what is beyond our imagination and confront us with the seemingly unbelievable testimonies of direct witness. The works are accompanied, uh, accompanied by historical comments to help a viewer better understand exhibited works. Once again, we see the amazing role of art in translating to new generations what the hell of Auschwitz was and why it's so important that it will not happen again. You might have thought that physical destruction of human life and the killing of human dignity and individuality that attended it would have knocked people insensible, made them break down and completely wipe out their readiness to engage in any sorts of activity. Yet side by side with the brutality uh, of life in the con con um, concentration camp, there was another secret life that prisoners led, remote from the realities that surrounded them. It played a huge role in helping many of them survive and keep their balance of mind, bringing an aspect of normality into the irrationalities of the concentration camp and taking your mind off them, getting away just for a while mentally back to, uh, to the time when uh, they were free, uh, when they enjoyed the beauty of nature and happy life. That was one of the key types of activity prisoners pursued. They engaged in anything that took them away into another world. Among them are individual cards and wall albums made by prisoners for their camp colleagues on the occasion of their birthdays, names days or holidays, objects created for local people in gratitude for their help landscapes from their homeland, views of, place, of places they loved, portraits of loved ones made from memory. In drawings, in small objects made by prisoners with their own hands, we discover everything what was the most important for them, for what was worth risking the life, but what also gave them a strength to survive. The stories behind these artworks were showed in another exhibition entitled Forbidden Art. The exhibition presents in appealing way the camp uh, art created illegally by prisoners in spite of the suffering and crimes as an expression of revolt and escape from the nightmarish reality surrounding them to cre creative act and the beauty resulting thereof. The works of camp art gathered in the Auschwitz Museum collections are exceptional, powerful evidence of the strong and uh, freedom of the human spirit. They are a bridge linking the prisoners through their art into which they poured their feelings and emotions with the beholder, with us. A bridge that enables us to stand face to face with people sentenced to Auschwitz. Their authentic testimony in the form of works made in the very center of the nightmare. It's impossible to remain indifferent uh, to this kind of testimony. Contemporary people become eyewitness and art become a way of knowing, understanding, and reflecting on the nature of the human tragedy in the monstrous world of the concentration camps and death center. Thank you.